Well, our scripture reading this morning is Psalm 29. Psalm 29. It's on page 544 in your pre-Bible. Again, that's Psalm 29, page 544. Psalm 29, beginning in verse 1. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry, glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Let's pray together and then we'll look at this psalm. Lord, thank you that your word is inspired. It's God breathed. Lord, you are uh, speaking to us through your word and your spirit speaks as well. Lord, uh, we pray that you'd show us what this psalm meant when David wrote it and how it applies to our lives now. Uh, for surely, Lord, everything that was written beforehand was written for our sake, that we might be encouraged and have hope. So, Lord, bless us during that to- this time. Fill us with your spirit and speak to every heart. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In Psalm 29, David is reflecting on a tremendous thunder and lightning storm, which apparently he had recently witnessed, and how he saw God's great power and majesty displayed through it. The greatness of the storm revealed the greatness of his God. If the power and majesty of the storm are so great, so awesome, what must the power and might be like of the one who sent it? David, knowing that the awesomeness of the storm is but a shadow of the awesomeness of the one who sent it, summons all to come and bow down and worship with reverence before the holy God. Ascribe to the Lord, O holy heavenly beings, Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Everyone, David says, should ascribe to God the glory which is his rightful due as the awe-inspiring, all-powerful Lord of all. And that should be our goal in every situation in life also. It's a formula for a successful living. As Thomas Brooks writes, To give God the glory due his name should be our goal in all we do. It should should consume all lesser ends, like Aaron's rod swallowed up all the magician's rods, or as Pharaoh's seven lean cows ate up the fat ones. What are your goals? What are your aspirations in life? Whatever they are, let them be swallowed up by this one all-consuming goal of glorifying God in every situation. Like Aaron's rod swallowed up all the magician's rods and Pharaoh's gaunt cows swallowed up all the fat ones. And you'll enjoy the most blessed life possible. It won't be a life free of trouble, mind you, but one free of regrets. In terms of the peace you'll experience here and the the unmatched joy you'll experience when you finally spy your reward in heaven. Another way to say this, as David does here, is worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. As the Old Testament priests served and worshiped the Lord, they they wore beautiful robes. And, And David is saying, clothe yourself in the beauty of holiness as you worship the Lord. Adorn yourself as Christ's bride with fine linen, bright and pure, which is the righteous deeds of the saints. Live a holy life set apart for God and his purposes. Live for his will first and not your own. 
and you'll be especially beautiful and blessed in his sight. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Those are the robes we wear. David's overwhelmed by the power and majesty of the storm, and it causes him to reflect on the far greater power and majesty of the one who sent it, leading him to summon everyone to come and worship before the throne of God and give him the honor which is his due, and his due alone, because he alone sends the storm and no other. As you know, this is a matter of some controversy in David's day. Not everyone ascribed the greatness and the positive results of the storm to Yahweh, the God of Israel. For example, the Canaanites, who were Israel's neighbors, they said it was Baal, the storm god, who sent fertility and rain and all the blessings from the storm. They didn't ascribe the glory to God, but to Baal, the false god, a usurper, as all idols are. The Canaanites said Baal was the face behind the storm. They called him cloud rider in their religious texts, as one author points out. But David utterly rejects that for the lie that it is. Ascribe these things to the Lord and not other deities, especially not Baal, David says. And give the Lord what is his rightful due and his alone. Uh, this seems to be one of the themes that runs through Psalm 29, as we'll see. Who's the power behind the storm? Who is victor over the floodwaters? The psalmist shows the lords over these things and not their false gods, as, as one puts it. As Christians, we can easily see the mistake that these pagans made. They said that nature had many faces, or more precisely, that there were many faces behind nature. Every tree had its God, every mountain, every river had its God, every place, every nation had its God. There were many faces behind nature. They didn't give God his just due in that they ascribed all his great works to many other gods, but false gods weren't gods at all. We in the modern world tend to make the op opposite mistake, though, don't we? We say that nature has no face. Or more precisely, that there's no face behind the material world, only impersonal laws and forces. We say there's no one at home in the universe. It's only a vast machine. And so we rob God of the glory, which is his due also. We don't acknowledge God's handiwork in creation, even though his fingerprints are to be seen all over it. We suppress the truth in unrighteousness, as Paul says. By not acknowledging nature's laws and forces as the handiwork of the divine mind, we allow ourselves to tap into God's power without having any moral accountability to him. A nature without a face is one which can ask us no uncomfortable questions about our lifestyle. And we in our fallen nature, we're much more comfortable with that. An impersonal universe, not one that asks questions. Natural causes, as men call them, are God and nature. But our modern wise men will have us believe in laws and forces and anything or nothing so that they may be rid of God, as Charles Spurgeon writes. But the tragic thing is that in doing this, we miss out on good news. In fact, tremendous news. The fact that there's a face behind nature is really very good news for all who will have it. First, because it means that nature can be reasoned with, so to speak. If there's a face behind nature, then we can cry out to him for help in our storms. And he can help us out of them or through them. We're not at the mercy of some heartless and personal laws and forces. If there's a God at home in the universe listening to us, we can cry out to him for rescue. Secondly, we'll find that the one who's behind the storm is predisposed to rescue us. He wants to help us. If you call out to him, you'll find that the face behind nature is a smiling one. It's a friendly one. It's a forgiving one. It's a merciful one. Toward all who will come to him and acknowledge him and give him the glory which is his due. He's already shown that to us and how he came to earth as one of us. God came to earth in the person of Jesus uh, he died on the cross to pay for all our sins, as you know. 
We deserve to die. We deserve to be punished. But he took our place so that we could be forgiven. So that forgiveness is available to anybody who comes to him now. And you'll find that, the again, the, the face behind nature is a smiling one. When we acknowledge him, ask him for forgiveness and eternal life, he, he generously grants it, freely grants it. Well, let's take a look at this storm, which David says reveals God's glory and strength. Uh, it begins over the Mediter Mediterranean Sea, over many waters in verse 3. It then heads inland east to the Lebanon mountains in verses 5 and 6. And there it hits Mount Lebanon and Mount Syrian. That's another name for Mount Hermon. And then it heads uh, south through Israel, perhaps hitting the temple in Jerusalem along the way, till finally it reads the southernmost part of Israel in the wilderness of Kadesh, where nobody lives, and then it, it just dissipates, it fizzles out. But it leaves in its path a wake of destruction and fear. All creatures are in awe of it. As one author describes it, a mighty tempest boiling the Mediterranean and sweeping inland across the north to Lebanon and Hermon, then turning south to swing across the moors of Kadesh, with lightning splitting the cedars, thunder shaking the wilderness, the gale twisting the oaks and stripping the forest, floods deluging the plains, makes the exulting psalmist feel that everything in the temple of nature is crying glory and such majestic power. Notice that the storm hits the sea, the mountains, the trees, the plains, the desert, all areas thought to be under the control of the pagan gods. But the Lord passes through all these places, exercising his supreme power. He's over these things. And he rattles their cages and rattles the cages of the pagan gods as he goes. He alone rules over the seas, mountains, forests, plains, and deserts. Not they. He alone is God and shares his glory with no other. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The, the Lord over many waters. Verse 3. The voice of the Lord is often associated with thunder in the Bible. Often God speaks out of the thunder. As Spurgeon states, thunder is called the voice of the Lord. Since it peals from on high, it surpasses all other sounds. It inspires awe. It is entirely independent of man and is sometimes accompanied by God's message to man. Peals of thunders are the church bells summoning men and angels to worship as it puts his fear in them. God's voice is like thunder. It comes from on high. It's tremendously powerful. And it inspires people with awe as it should. What's more, since it's often accompanied by lightning, it can bring enlightenment or it can bring judgment depending on how one responds to it. If you think God's voice is powerful in the storm, you should see it in his word. The thunder is but a faint echo of the might of his promises and commands. His word in the Bible is so powerful it can help you out of or through any difficult situation in life. It can give you the wisdom you need at, at all moments. It can comfort you when all earthly comforts seem to have ceased. We can trust in his promises which are incomparably more powerful than the lightning. This particular thunder which David saw came down over many waters of the sea, which was thought to be the realm of certain false gods. The Canaanites thought the sea to be the battleground between Yam, the god of the sea and of chaos, and Baal, the god of fertility and thunderstorms, as one author notes. But it's actually the Lord who's over the raging waters, up above and down below, in the, sea, in the heavens and the sea. He's the one who's over them. The false gods don't reign over them. He does. Continuing verse 4, the Lord, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. It said that when a lion roars, it's so terrifying, everything around it freezes. All creatures freeze for a moment in fear. That's what it's like when the Lord roars in the storm. It's terrifying. It freezes you. The animals certainly think so, as we see in verse 9. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth. It's so frightening the deer go into labor prematurely, give birth prematurely because of their fear. Uh, my mother once had an opportunity to see what animals think of, of storms up close and personal. Uh, we used to have a shed in our backyard, a big shed where my mother, she ran an, uh, 
home reupholstering business. And she, we had a good sized shed, so she worked out there. One day she was working on the shed, she had the double doors open, and a tremendous thunder and lightning storm just moved in the neighborhood. Uh, since she was only, the only one around in the neighborhood at the time, slowly but surely, every dog in the neighborhood came into the shed and gathered with her. There were about nine dogs in there. Under normal circumstances, a number of these dogs were mortal enemies. <laughs> Uh, they would have been at each other's throats, literally. But in the face of the storm's might, all those petty rivalries, rivalries melted away. As they cowered before the wrath of the storm, they became like scared little puppies. In the face of the storm, all else faded into insignificance. I think that's a good picture of what it will be like before we, when we stand before the Lord in judgment. All will be meek and silent. There's going to be no melting off as we stand before the majesty of God's overwhelming presence. The Lion of Judah will have roared and we'll all be still and hushed. But the storm can be terrifying, not just for animals, as you know. One time when I was a kid, I was covering a paper route. It was an afternoon paper route from a friend of mine. And the skies began to darken. I was coming up this long hill on my bike when the heavens opened and I found myself in a car wash, <laughs> at least a bike wash. I was drenched to the bone before I got halfway up the hill. I was literally just soaked. As I slowly pedaled my way up the incline, suddenly about 10 feet away, there was this huge tree and I heard a crackling and sizzling sound. And then a boom, lightning bolt. Oh, with the angles, nothing personal. Boom, it went up the tree lit up the whole sky, and it was so loud. My, I, it was like a, I was standing at a concert next to the speaker of the drummer. Boom, 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 boom. It was tremendously powerful. It's like a sonic boom. I pedaled up that hill so fast, I could beat Lam, Lance Armstrong on his best day. I, tell you. <laughs> I can personally testify that when the Lord speaks in the thunder and lightning, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Of course, that tree's not the only ones that suffered ill effects in thunder and lightning storms, is it? We see that in verse 5. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. As we noted, when the Lord speaks in the thunder, it's often accompanied by lightning. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire, verse 7. And these can destroy the trees of the forest, even the mightiest trees like the famous trees of Lebanon, the cedars of Lebanon. The grand cedars were felled and splintered to pieces, as one puts it. Even the mountains shook and skipped like rams at his voice. Verse 6, he makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. As I said, when I was almost hit by lightning, there was this sonic boom. You know, I felt it. I shook. And that's what he's describing, I think. My innards were God's bass drum. His voice causes even the mountains to shake. Uh, the Lebanon mountains are about 10,000 feet above sea level, and they were thought to be the home of the Canaanite gods. The Canaanites thought their gods lived up there. But the Lord comes to the home of these false gods of Canaan. Again, he rattles their cages, and there's nothing they can do about it, especially since they don't exist. As one writes, the Canaanites thought these mountains were the abode of the gods. The Lord shows them no respect. He shakes the mountain and fells the trees. No respect. <laughs> he is the Lord of land and sea, including the mountains, and not they. The storm next reaches the southernmost part of Israel out in the uninhabited desert of Kadesh. Verse 8, the voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The wilderness was thought to be the haunt of demons. God rattles their cage too. God's voice is heard. His reign extends even to places where people never travel. He rules over the farthest star. He rules over the creatures in the very depths of the sea where no person's ever been. He rules over the smallest and atoms and cells never seen by human beings. As Job says, he cares for the animals out in places where people never go. Spurgeon says, God courts not the applause of men. His grandest deeds are wrought where man's and 
inquisitive glance is all unknown. God reigns in the Father's star. We never see it. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry glory. It's not clear if the temple in view here is the one in Jerusalem or the temple in heaven. Uh, it could be that the storm had passed through Jerusalem as it went and people hid in the temple precincts from it. In which case the worshipers in the temple, they see the awesome power of the storm and they know the voice of the Lord is even more powerful and full of majesty. They worship crying glory, as one has said. Or it could be that the angels in heaven's temple, they're sitting in the balcony seats. <laughs> they're enjoying this sound and light show from above and they just shout glory when they see God's power and majesty in it. Either way, the audience is amazed at what's happening. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. After the tempest, floodwaters rage. The wadis are riverbeds. They're usually almost dry, but suddenly they just fill with torrents and they rage. The brooks in Lebanon, which are nearly dry, can suddenly become impassable torrents. The description of the, these swollen torrents closes the scene, as one writes. The, the pagans in their myths, they thought it was their gods who ruled over the flood. But again, it's the Lord who actually rules over it. He's the one who can help you in the flood, as Noah found out. He can help us too. Flood follows tempest, but Jehovah is ready for the emergency, writes one. <laughs> The Hebrew word for flood here, it's only used in one other place with reference to Noah's flood. So it could be these raging floodwaters after the storm. They, uh, they bring to mind uh, for David uh, Noah's flood. But the Lord sits even over that. He's over even the greatest floods and storms of life. Nothing is too difficult for him. He's the one we should turn to even in the greatest storms we face. And David closes the psalm with a prayer for that. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. David tells us why he wrote this storm, why, wrote this psalm, why he spoke of this storm. He wants us to know that that incredible power, that, that strength, that majesty, that glory that you see in the storm, that is available to you as a child of God. His great power can bring us peace or shalom, well-being, even in the midst of the tempests of our own life. So David prays that for us. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Give to God the glory which is his due, even when you're in the midst of a storm. Don't fear, but remember that he's in control. He sits over it all. He's over desert, plain, mountain, trees, sky, and sea. And if he can control all these mighty forces with just a word of his mouth, he can help you in your troubles also with just a word. So when you have troubles, reflect on the face and the power behind the storm. Get into his temple and cry glory. And you will find peace in the midst of the storm. And the calm that comes after it, as you see how he's blessed you through it in due time. Let's pray. Lord, when we look at nature, we look at its beauty, we look at its power, its majesty. Uh, Lord, it's, it's um, incredible, the forces of nature, its power. But Lord, it's just a faint echo of who you are. And it is nothing compared to you. And so, Lord, we put our trust in you as the face behind the storm, a smiling face, uh, a one who receives us when we bow down before you and one who can help us. And again, Lord, as we sang earlier, Lord, I need you. Uh, some here are facing storms. And I pray, Lord, help them to find that peace in the midst of it as they trust you and lead them to that place of calm after the storm as they continue to walk with you. Praise the things in Jesus' name. Amen. William Gurnall offers this illustration. Let's say you're afflicted with some deadly disease, but there's a medicine that has a 100% cure rate for this particular disease. Wouldn't we say a man was saved as soon as he drank that medicine, even if we didn't see the results yet? 
In the same way, when we learn to sing amid the thunder, as another has put it, to ascribe to God the glory due his name, even in the midst of our trials, we've already begun to administer the one certain cure for our difficulties. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord glory to his name, worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness, and he will give you strength and bless you with peace. Amen.